We want to start care of the patient with a reproductive disorder. Make sure that you pay attention as I'm going through this lecture about things that I tell you that is extremely important and things that you better make sure that you know. That is a verbal study guide as we're going through this chapter. Okay, so we're going to take a look at an overview of the reproductive system. This is just a, a recap of what you already learned in anatomy and physiology. And this is going to be a very brief uh, overview because this, these are things you should already know from A and P. So when we talk about the male reproductive system, this includes, uh, number one, the testes. The testes are enclosed in the scrotum. We know uh, that the production of testosterone takes place there, which is responsible for the male's secondary sex characteristics. Uh, you're talking about like uh, the deepening of the voice, uh, their um, muscle mass is greater. You also have uh, facial hair, axillary hair, pubic hair, different things like that, which is considered to be those uh, secondary sex characteristics. The ductal system is next. Uh, the ductal system is comprised of the epididymis. The epididymis is just simply a tightly uh, coiled tube structure. The ductus difference, also known as the vas difference, and you better make sure that these terms, make sure you know that these terms are used interchangeably, okay? So the ductus difference and the vas difference are the same thing. And a very important thing that you need to make sure that you remember about the ductus difference or the vas difference is the fact that whenever, uh, whenever this uh, ductal system is severed, this is what happens during a vasectomy, when a vasectomy is performed. Okay, so this is actually severed when a vasectomy is performed. So that's very important to remember about the ductus difference, aka the vas difference. That is what is severed when a vasectomy is performed. You also um, have a picture Okay, the, an anatomical picture at the top of the page at the beginning of this chapter that shows you all of the anatomical regions that we are talking about. So if you have forgotten these, make sure you go back and understand anatomically where these um, parts of the reproductive system are located. Because when we start talking about problems with the prostate and different things like that, you have to understand uh, when, a, uh, when a male has like BPH, for example, uh, what kind of signs and symptoms you will see with, um, with that disorder. So make sure you familiarize yourself with the anatomy. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about with the ductal system is the ejaculatory duct and urethra. Now the duct actually unites with the urethra and it passes through the prostate gland. Okay, so that is what we're talking about with the ejaculatory duct and urethra. So the duct unites with the urethra and it passes through the prostate gland. Next, we're moving on to accessory glands. And these are involved with the production of semen. So we're gonna be talking about uh, the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland and the Cowper's glands. So the seminal vesicles, they produce 60% of the semen volume. So that, that's their main function, producing about 60% of semen volume. Prostate gland, it secretes an alkaline fluid that contributes to the sperm's motility, okay? So it can uh, be motile. The Cowper's glands, they provide lubrication during intercourse. So that is what the function of the Cowper's glands is. Next, moving on to the urethra and penis. The urethra has two purposes. Um, the first is to transport urine from the bladder, and the second one is to carry sperm to the outside of the body. So it, it has two purposes. The penis is the organ of copulation. The skin covering the penis is called the previs or the foreskin. Now this excess tissue is what is removed during a circumcision. And that is done a lot to prevent a condition, which we'll talk about more uh, later on in the chapter called phimosis. Phimosis is a, tighten, is, is a tightening of the previs of the penis, and that prevents the retraction of the foreskin from occurring. So you can't pull the foreskin back when you're talking about phimosis. And again, later on in the chapter, we'll be talking about phimosis and paraphimosis a little bit later. So again, all phimosis is the foreskin cannot be pulled back over the head of the penis. So that is, that is a lot of the times uh, why 
uh, you know, circumcisions are done to prevent this condition from occurring. Moving on to sperm, you learned in A and P, spermatogenesis is the process of developing spermatozoa. Um, and it begins at puberty, and it continues throughout life. Now, the mature sperm, again, has three parts that you've already learned about, the head, the midpiece, and the tail. Sperm can live approximately 48 hours, and according to the book, sometimes up to five days in the female reproductive system. So that is a pretty long time. So again, if you have forgotten any of these uh, any of these things that we have just talked about, make sure that you go back and refresh your brain uh, in regards to your anatomy and physiology because you've got to remember all of this stuff as we're talking about these different disorders. Moving on to the female reproductive system. Uh, again, there is pictures located in your book that shows you the um, the longitudinal section of the female pelvis, and it shows the location of their female reproductive organs that you can look at while we're talking about them. Uh, you also have a figure that shows you uh, a view of the uterus, and it shows you its relationship in regards to the ovaries and the vagina. So it shows you there the fundus, it shows you the body, the cervix, it shows you all those different things there. It shows you the wall of the uterus. You have the endometrium, the parametrium, the myometrium. Okay, so. Again, familiarize yourself with those anatomical locations if you have forgotten them. So starting off with the female reproductive system, we're going to talk about the ovaries first. Um, at puberty, the ovaries release progesterone and estrogen. Um, the fallopian tubes, the fallopian tubes, you learned, uh, they are lined with cilia. Uh, fertilization takes place in the outer third of the tube. Moving on to the uterus, the uterus has three tissue layers, the endometrium being the innermost, the myometrium being the middle, and the perimetrium being the outermost layer. The vagina, uh, it is a thin-walled muscular tube-like structure. It's located between uh, the urinary bladder and the rectum, and you can see uh, right there when you look at that uh, view in your book, you can see exactly where it's located. You also have external genitalia, which includes the mons pubis, the labia majora, the labia minora, the clitoris, and the vestibule. So you can take a look at um, the locations of those as well. Uh, you also have accessory glands that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the Skeen's glands and the Bartholin's glands. And you have a picture of those in your book as well that you can take a look at and see where they're located. With the Skeen's glands, they secrete mucus. The Bartholin's glands, uh, they also um, are mucus secreting glands, and that provides lubrication for intercourse with the Bartholin's. Moving on to the perineum, the perineum starts at the symphysis pubis and extends to the anus. You then have the mammary glands, okay, the breasts. They contain uh, the milk producing cells in their lobules. Uh, when you think about prolactin, and you learned about this uh, when you studied about the endocrine system in A and P, prolactin causes milk formation, and the oxytocin allows milk to be released. Okay, so prolactin is the milk producer, and that's how I always remembered that. So prolactin is the milk producer. The oxytocin allows the milk to be released, and I always remembered that because oxytocin starts with an O, and I always associated that with the word out, okay? So it's getting the milk out. It's being released. Uh, again, from A&P, uh, you should remember that prolactin, if you remember, that uh, comes from our anterior pituitary. The oxytocin comes from the posterior pituitary. And I have included a picture of the endocrine system um, in your slides that you can take a look at uh, to re-familiarize yourself with what the anterior pituitary produces versus the posterior pituitary. So again, prolactin, that's our milk formation. It's the producer, the milk formation. Oxytocin allows milk to be released. It gets it out. Uh, the nipple is called the areola. Okay, and again, that's, that's basic anatomy and physiology, and that is as deep as we're going with that. Moving on to the menstrual cycle, 
Um, there is a term called uh, menarche, then that is considered to be the first menstrual cycle. So the first menstrual cycle is known as menarche. Uh, it usually begins at approximately 12 years of age. Uh, menstruation can occur anywhere between 30 to 40 years over a female's life. It is divided into three phases with the menstrual cycle. You have the menstrual, you have the preovulatory, and the postovulatory. And I am not going to test you on any of those phases. Okay, this is something you already learned in A&P, and we're not going to focus on that. So. Just know that it's divided into three phases with the menstrual cycle. You have menstrual, preovulatory, postovulatory. If you wish to look into that further, by all means, uh, do so. Uh, next is the effects of normal aging on the reproductive system. So menopause occurs between the ages of different books say different things around uh, early 40s uh, to the late 50s and years of age. The average age is 51. So when we think about the average age of menopause, it is 51. Things like cigarette smoking, family history, surg uh, surgical intervention, uh, high altitudes, these are associated with an early onset of menopause. Now during menopause, menstrual flow is going to cease and hormone levels are going to decline. Uh, Women have hot flashes, and that is due to the decrease in estrogen production. Their vagina starts to lose elasticity. The breasts and the vulva start to lose adipose tissue, and the bones become brittle, and they're more prone to osteoporosis. Uh, all these things we have to look forward to as we age. Hormone changes in men, well, they tend to be more subtle. Sperm production uh, decreases, but it does not stop. Also, testosterone production decreases, but not significantly. Now, you have some lifespan considerations that you need to make sure that you look at uh, in regards to uh, reproductive disorders in older adults. So they've got it bulleted there for uh, women and men, so make sure that you look through those and read them. Okay, so here's your slide of the endocrine system. And again, this is just a recap of what you've already learned in anatomy and physiology. Uh, it's showing you uh, the neurosecretory cells. Uh, they produce and release uh, inhibiting hormones and things like that. Again, I am not going to test you on what does the anterior pituitary produce? What does the posterior pituitary produce? I'm not going to do that. So just re-familiarize yourself, and it, it will help you a great deal, especially in the third term, to very much be familiar with the endocrine system. Uh, with the anterior pituitary there, you see that it has an influence on the ovaries and testes with the FSH and LH. Uh, also, you see the GH, the growth hormone for our bones and tissues, the prolactin uh, for the mammary glands the ACTH for the adrenal cortex, the TSH for the thyroid, and then over there on the posterior pituitary side, you see it's involved uh, with the production of oxytocin, uh, again, which uh, has to do with our mammary glands, and it also has to do with uh, smooth muscle in the uterus, okay? That also has to do with oxytocin, and you'll learn more about that as you get into maternal health. You also see that the posterior pituitary is involved with the production of ADH, antidiuretic hormone. And uh, again, you will be learning a lot more about uh, how ADH affects certain disorders when you get to the endocrine chapter in the third term. So this is just an overview for you to recall what is produced by the anterior pituitary and what is produced by the posterior pituitary. Okay, so moving on with reproductive disorders, we're gonna first talk about human sexuality. Sexuality and sex, we know, are two different things. Sexuality is the sense of being a woman or a man. It has biological, psychological, social, and ethical dimensions attached to it. The term sex describes the biological aspect of sexuality, such as genital sexual activity, and it can be used for pleasure or reproduction. Now, sexual identity, we're gonna talk about gender identity. Gender identity is the sense of being feminine or masculine. Gender role is the manner in which a person acts as a woman or man. There are societal influences that are involved. 
cultural factors also play a significant uh, part in defining our sex roles. For example, uh, males are considered uh, to be the breadwinners. Female is considered to be the caregiver. Now, some groups are more flexible about the variety of roles for males and females. And that's just something that we have to be aware of as nurses as we take care of patients from different cultures. Now, sexual orientation is the clear and persistent erotic desire of a person for uh, one sex or the other. So again, sexual orientation is the clear and persistent erotic desire of a person for one sex or the other. For some people, the inward sense of their sexual identity does not match their biological body. And these uh, people are called transgendered. A transvestite is usually a heterosexual man who sometimes dresses like a woman. They can be a homosexual as well. They may or may not be. Uh, however, we have to make sure that we remember as nurses, we must maintain a non-judgmental attitude while caring for all patients. It's not up to us to judge anyone. We are there to take care of that patient and give them the best care that they can have. And we do not treat them any different than any other patient that we are taking care of. Uh, taking a sexual history is next. Uh, First off, with taking a sexual history, uh, this is something that we need to obtain early uh, in the nurse-patient relationship. Sometimes traumatic events such as rape uh, may require a slower uh, data collection um, you know, than someone who has not been involved with a sexual assault. So we may have to go a little slower with our collection of data with someone who has been victimized. Uh, we need to avoid overreacting or underreacting to a, a patient comments, okay? Because we want to make sure that they are giving us truthful data collection. And if they see in us that we are overreacting or underreacting, they might not tell us everything that we need to know during this sexual history. We need to use language that the patient understands. It's important to move from less sensitive to more sensitive areas to promote that uh, comfort between the nurse and the patient. At the end of the sexual history, we need to ask the patient uh, if they have any additional questions or concerns. And remember, we always ask open-ended questions. You know, what questions do you have for me? You know, we don't want to ask any question that requires a response to be yes or no. Now, um, a brief sexual history includes um, some questions that we're going to look at in your book. So the first um, box, it is a blue box, and it says requirements for taking a sexual history. And we're going to look at that. So we see there uh, in these bullets, we see provision of privacy. We need to make sure that they are in a closed room. Uh, an atmosphere of trust. We need to make sure that we're uh, you know, instilling in our patients uh, that everything they tell us is confidential. The nurse's comfort with their own sexuality, again, this comes into the point where we do not judge. And again, uh, the, four, the fourth bullet there is a non-judgmental approach. Health promotion factors that can interfere with the promotion of sexual health includes the following. A lack of information, conflicting value systems with attitudes and beliefs, anxiety, okay? Are specific attitudes, feelings, and actions normal? Guilt can interfere, lack of comfort with sexuality, invasion of privacy, lack of regard for hospitalized patients' need for time alone with their significant other. Okay, that can affect it. The manner in which the patient is touched, fear of being judged. You know, sometimes people might think, gosh, um, I'm a homosexual and I'm ashamed to tell this nurse uh, that I am because, you know, I don't want to be judged. You know, because like it or not, people still, you know, are judged from, from their sexuality. So they might be, you know, fearful of telling the nurse this if they fear that they will be judged. Uh, lack of understanding of the effects of illness and treatment on sexual functioning. Okay, so that is just telling you in a nutshell some things that can hinder or interfere, you know, with a health promotion when you're trying to gather a sexual history. So um, again, just make sure you read over that. You do not have to memorize anything from that box, just have a basic understanding. Go down to the next box entitled Brief Sexual History. 
Okay, with our brief sexual history, here are some of the questions that you may have to ask during, uh, during your assessment. And make sure you tell your patients, these are questions that we have to ask everyone so they don't feel like they're being singled out by being asked these questions. These questions are asked to everyone. Just make sure you tell them that. So uh, first bullet there, has your illness, pregnancy or hospitalization interfered with your being a husband, wife, significant other, father or mother? Uh, second bullet, has your, for example, abortion or heart attack changed the way you see yourself as a woman or man? The third bullet, has your, for example, if they had a colostomy, a mastectomy, or a hysterectomy, has that changed your ability to function sexually, or has it altered your sex life? Okay, so these are, again, th this is just a brief sexual history, and these are questions that you may have to ask as a nurse to your patients. So next we're going to be going through a slew of laboratory and diagnostic examinations. Pay close attention to things that I tell you that are extremely important through here. Okay? So we're going to start off with what is called a colposcopy. And I have added some pictures uh, after this slide that shows you an example of a colposcopy, a coldoscopy, a laparoscopy, and also a cervical conization that you can look at. And also in the description box there is a video on a thin, preps, uh, thin prep collection so that you can watch uh, what goes on uh, with the collection uh, during a pap smear. Okay, so beginning with colposcopy, uh, this is going to provide direct visualization of the cervix and the vagina. Uh, the patient uh, should be taught, this is part of uh, patient teaching, that they should not douche or have sex 24 hours prior to the exam because that can mask abnormal cells. Explain the purpose of the procedure. Have the patient void or have a BM if they need to. A speculum is going to be inserted into the vagina. And then a colposcope, which is just a microscope that visualizes the vaginal walls and the cervix, that's going to examine those areas from the opening of the vagina. Uh, it can look and assess for the tissue color, the, any lesions, any vascular conditions can be observed, specimens can be taken, and then the procedure is usually uh, not done during menstruation, so it will not be done usually during menstruation. A coldoscopy is a diagnostic procedure that provides visualization of the uterus and its appendages. When we think about visualizing the uterus and the appendages, the appendages include the ovaries and the fallopian tubes. So that's what we're talking about with the appendages. So it's going to provide a visualization of not only the uterus, but also its appendages, which includes the ovaries and the fallopian tubes. It involves a, a vaginal operation. So this is actually going to be a vaginal operation. They may use a local spinal or general anesthesia. That's not up to us. That'll be up to the healthcare professional. The patient is going to be placed in a knee chest position and then the coldoscope is passed through the vaginal wall to examine for things like tumors, cysts, endometriosis, which we'll talk about that later. Now after the operation, what are you going to assess for? You know good and well during an operation you're going to be assessing for bleeding and I'm going to be monitoring those vital signs for looking for signs and symptoms of shock, okay? Uh, I'm also going to assess and make sure that my patient is able to void, okay, because inadvertently uh, organs can be damaged during any type of procedure. So I want to make sure that my patient is able to void after this procedure. So again, assessing for bleeding, monitoring vital signs, and voiding. And this is usually performed on an outpatient basis. Moving on to uh, laparoscopy, uh, this is where a small incision is going to be made below the umbilicus. And this is done to examine the abdominal cavity, okay, with a laparoscope. Uh, it's going to provide direct visualization of the uterus and its appendages. Again, that is just meaning the ovaries and the fallopian tubes uh, using general anesthesia. The ovaries and fallopian tubes are observed for things like masses, uh, adhesions, 
pelvic inflammatory disease, which is PID, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, we know with adhesions, adhesions, are, that's just scar tissue, okay? That's all that is. And again, we'll talk about PID um, a little bit later. Uh, just briefly, this is just an infection of like the uterus, the fallopian tubes, the ovaries, and the cervix. Now, if carbon dioxide um, is used during this procedure to distend the abdomen, you know, so they can get a fuller view of the abdomen, and carbon dioxide is used, uh, make sure that you inform your patient that they may experience shoulder pain, okay? So that is something that is common uh, whenever someone has their abdomen inflated with carbon dioxide so that they can better see, um, you know, uh, all the anatomical structures inside. If carbon dioxide is used to distend that abdomen, a lot of patients may experience shoulder pain, and that's just referred pain, okay? So shoulder pain is something to be expected. All right, so the next test we're going to talk about is what is called the Papanicolou, or a pap test or pap smear. What, why do we have a pap smear, a pap test? It's used for the diagnosis of cervical cancer. Okay, so it is very, very important to make sure that you remember when we talk about a Papanicolou test or a pap test, pap smear, whatever you want to call it, why, why do we have this done? I better make sure that I remember. It is used for the diagnosis of cervical cancer. That is why we are getting a pap. We're uh, trying to make sure that we do not have cervical cancer. So it's used to detect cervical cancer. A speculum, we all know, is used to widen the vagina to allow access to the cervix. Some of the newer uh, pap tests are the sh what is called the sure path and the thin prep pap tests, which I have included uh, for a video for you to watch. Uh, cell specimens are obtained and then they are rinsed in a liquid solution. Uh, you label your specimen with the date, their last menstrual period, um, if they are on est if they have estrogen or if they're on birth control pills, you make sure that you put that on there as well. Some very, very, very important patient teaching that is involved with a pap test, and you better make sure that you know this, okay? Instruct the patient not to douche, not to use tampons not to use vaginal medications. Even if they're prescribed, they do not, they cannot the day of the pap test use vaginal medications. Or they also, uh, an important thing to teach, they do not need to have sex at least 24 to 48 hours prior to the exam. Now some books say 24, some say 48. So we'll just go with 24 to 48. So again, very important teaching that I need to do for my patient who is going to be having a pap for the diagnosis of cervical cancer. I'm instructing my patient not to douche, use tampons, use vaginal medications, or have sex for at least 24 to 48 hours prior to the exam. Okay, your book talks about what is called the Bethesda system, and this is used to interpret pap results. Okay, and you have this in your book, I am not going to ask you to tell me about what is about the Bethesda system and, and what all uh, it incorporates. Okay, that, that is up to uh, that is up to the healthcare professional to give this diagnosis. But there are some things in here that are important that we need to make sure we take a look at because it is on your test. Okay, so let's look at the interpretation and the numerical system and then we're gonna go over to the Bethesda system. Uh, the title of this uh, box is called PAP Test Interpretation, Classifications, and Action. Okay, so we're gonna go through this because there is a test question that comes from this box. All right, so let's start with the interpretation, okay? So we have neg negative interpretation or normal. The numerical system is a class one because it's a negative or normal interpretation. Okay, go over to the Bethesda system. Okay, it says negative or normal. So if a class one, that is a normal negative pap smear. Look at uh, the next one. Probable negative may indicate some sort of infection. That is considered a class two. Okay, so class two could be um, infection. It can be due to atypical squamous cells, um, things like that. 
The next one, suspicious interpretation, but not conclusive for malignancy. That's a class three. So um, this may show uh, mild dysplasia, moderate dysplasia. When we think about the term dysplasia, dysplasia just means abnormal tissue. So there's some mild abnormal tissue or some moderate abnormal tissue there. Um, so that is considered a class three. Now a class four, very, very important. This is more suspicious and strongly su suggestive of malignancy. So with a class four, this is more suspicious, strongly suggestive of malignancy. So there is severe dysplasia. So there's severe abnormal tissue. This is considered what is called carcinoma in situ. And we'll talk more about this later. But this is a term you have to be familiar with. So carcinoma in situ. This is early stage cancer okay, that is confined to the site in which it started. Okay, so this is where the cancer started. This is carcinoma in situ. This is early stage cancer that has stayed confined to the site in which it started. So again, this is a class four, it's very important. We have more suspicious, strongly suggestive of malignancy with a class four. There is severe dysplasia, so severe abnormal tissue. We have carcinoma in situ which is just early stage cancer that has stayed confined to the site in which it started. Moving on to class five, this is conclusive for malignancy. Okay, we have an invasive carcinoma. So again, uh, there is a test question from there, uh, giving you a great detail about which one that it is that you need to know. So make sure you pay attention to that. All right, let's move on to biopsies. All right, biopsies are just tissue samples that are taken for evaluation to confirm or to locate a lesion. It can be performed by needle aspiration. Uh, it can be removed by forceps. It can be moved through, uh, removed through an incision. Okay, we have different types. We have breast biopsies. Breast biopsies help us to differentiate between benign and malignant breast conditions. Okay, plain and simple. Cervical biopsies. These are done to evaluate cervical lesions. Uh, they're also done to diagnose cervical cancers. Moving on to endometrial biopsies. Endometrial biopsies, uh, we collect tissue for the diagnosis of uh, endometrial cancer. They might also do endometrial biopsies for infertility studies. The thing with endometrial biopsies is it's usually done at the time of menstruation. So the patient is going to be on their period during the endometrial biopsy when the cervix is dilated, okay, and the cells are more easily obtained during that time. And they just locally anesthetize the cervix during this endometrial biopsy. Now moving on to some more uh, other diagnostic studies, we're going to talk about conization. All right, so conization is done to remove eroded or infected tissue or to confirm cervical cancer. Uh, a cone-shaped section is actually removed uh, when the mass is confined to the epithelial tissue. So they're, they're removing a cone-shaped section, okay? And I have placed a picture on the slides that shows you the example of a conization and what is being removed. So it is just where a cone-shaped section is being removed. Um, when we're especially thinking about cervical cancer. Now, what do we think about after a conization with this cone-shaped section being removed post-op? Well, the area is going to be packed with gauze to control bleeding. So what am I going, what is my priority? What am I observing for? Hemorrhage, okay? I am observing very closely for hemorrhaging. Lots of bright red bleeding. That is always the thing that you're going to go through, go to first with your patients. You think about airway, you also better be thinking about bright red bleeding, okay, hemorrhaging. So I'm watching for that. Usually after a conization, the patient is discharged the same day unless there were complications. Now, very importantly, a DNC, okay? DNC is what we're talking about next, and you better make sure you remember this. This is a procedure to obtain, uh, number one, tissue for biopsy, number two, to correct cervical stricture, Stricture is just a narrowing, so uh, we're thinking about cervical narrowing. 
Uh, it is also done, number three, for the treatment of dysmenorrhea. Dysmenorrhea is painful menstruation, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later on. So again, why is a patient getting a DNC? I better make sure that I know these, okay? Well, it's done for, uh, to obtain tissue for biopsy. It's done to correct cervical strictures or narrowing. It's also done for the treatment of dysmenorrhea, which means painful menstruation. Um, they can use uh, different types of anesthesia. It might be spinal, it can be general, whatever. We're not concerned with that. Um, when we think about, when we think about um, a patient with dysmenorrhea, that is just someone who has debilitating, painful menstruation. It's, a, it's above and beyond someone who just has some light menstrual cramps, okay? Now, packing is going to be inserted, and also uh, they're going to use a perineal pad to absorb any drainage when the packing is removed. Teach the patient to observe for excessive bleeding or any type of malodorous discharge. If a patient is having malodorous discharge, we know that is indicative of infection. So we're teaching our patient, once they go home, you watch for excessive bright red bleeding, you also watch for malodorous drainage, and you better notify and get to the hospital immediately and notify the physician. Now the most common reason for a DNC is for the treatment of dysmenorrhea. So the most common reason for a DNC to be performed is for the treatment of dysmenorrhea, that painful menstruation. So again, the most common reason for a DNC is for the treatment of dysmenorrhea, painful menstruation. That is extremely important. I better make sure that I know what are all the reasons for a DNC and what's the most common reason for the treatment of dysmenorrhea. All right, moving on to cultures and smears. Uh, when we think about cultures and smears, they're collected to examine and identify infectious processes, uh, also to identify abnormal cells, uh, hormonal changes of the reproductive tissues. The smear is placed on a glass slide. It's covered with another slide or it might be sprayed with a fixative. Uh, always make sure that you use aseptic technique to avoid the spread of organisms. Cultures can be taken from the breast, they can be taken from the vagina, the rectum, and also the urethra. All right, moving on to Schiller's iodine test. So Schiller's iodine test. This is used in the early detection of cancer cells, okay? And it can also be used for a guide uh, for biopsies. So it guides them into what areas need to be biopsied. So again, a Schiller's iodine test is used in the early detection of cancer cells, and it's also used as a guide for biopsies. So how is this done? Well, an iodine prep is applied to the cervix. So they apply this iodine prep to the cervix, and the glycogen, okay, this is back to A&P, the glycogen, which is present in normal cells, will stain brown. So the glycogen, which is present in normal cells, stains brown. Abnormal, so abnormal or immature cells do not absorb the stain. So those unstained areas are going to be the areas that may be biopsied. Okay, so that is something that we think about with this. So very, very um, important and very briefly, with a Schiller's iodine test, you take iodine, they apply it to the cervix, the glycogen that's present in normal cells, it's going to stain brown. So the normal areas of the cervix are staining brown. Abnormal cells do not absorb the stain. Okay, so those unstained areas are the areas that will be biopsied. Okay, plain and simple, that's all you need to know. All right. Uh, some of the radiographic tests, uh, radiographic tests uh, and exams, they just detect abnormal tissues. Um, when we think about radiographic tests, we're just talking about x-rays, okay? Uh, they're done to locate abnormal structures. They can also uh, confirm things like duct patency, when we think about the ductal system in males. Um, hysterograms and hysterosalpingograms, we're going to talk about those. Uh, why are these done? Well, they're done to visualize the uterus and the fallopian tubes to confirm uh, problems with the tubal system, 
Uh, also, the presence of foreign bodies. Uh, it can also tell us about congenital malformations that the patient may have been born with. It can also be done to detect fibroids and traumatic injuries. So how is a hysterogram or a hysterosalpingogram done? Well, the patient is placed in a lithotomy position. A speculum is then inserted into the vagina and a cannula is inserted into the cervical cavity. Uh, then you have contrast medium that is injected through that cannula and into the uterus and then it flows into the fallopian tubes. And those areas can be viewed uh, with a fluoroscope. When we talked about fluoroscopy, when we talked about fluoroscopy, remember that's just like a, a real-time X-ray movie. Okay, that's what we're talking about. And they take films of the areas. Okay, so that is all that is being done with a hysterogram or hysterosalpingogram. So when we think about uh, particularly the when we talk about the hysterogram, that is just the X-ray of the uterus using the contrast medium. So only the uterus is being looked at. When we think about the hysterosalpingogram, this is where the X-rays, uh, the exam is going to be not only of the uterus but also the fallopian tubes using that contrast. Okay, so hysterogram only looking at the uterus. Hysterosalpingogram is the uterus and fallopian tubes that's being looked at with that contrast medium. All right, moving on to mammography. Very, very, very important information coming up here. So with a mammography, uh, again, this is just a radiography of the soft tissue of the breast. So they're doing x-ray of the breasts. Digital mammography uses computer images instead of films. Okay, it is clear and more accurate with digital mammographies. The American Cancer Society recommends annual mammograms between the ages of 40 to 44. It is believed that the average breast tumor is present uh, anywhere between 9 to 10 years before it is palpable. So a person, a, a person can have breast cancer for 9 to 10 years. Okay, some books say nine, some say 10. So we're going with nine to 10. I'm not gonna ask you on the test about it. So for nine to 10 years, they have had breast cancer and they are unaware of it because they could not feel it. So again, this is the importance of teaching women about getting those annual mammograms early on. So we can have the early detection of breast cancer because again, that tumor can be present for up to nine to 10 years before they can even feel it. So some very, very important patient teaching about mammography. Prior to the procedure, advise your patient to refrain from using things like body powder, deodorant, and ointments to the breast area. So they do not need to use anything like body powders, deodorants, or ointments to the breast area prior to the procedure. This can cause false positive results. Give the patient a gown, have her remove jewelry and her upper garments. The patient will be instructed to hold her breath as the anterior view is taken. Okay, then uh, the machine rotates and then a lateral view is taken. Lateral just means from the side, okay? The procedure is done bilaterally. Uh, women who have a positive family history should also have an MRI just to be safe. So again, very, very imp important patient teaching to give my patient prior to a, a mammogram. Advise the patient to refrain from using body powders, deodorants, and ointments to the breast area. It can cause false positive results. Give the patient a gown and have her remove jewelry and upper garments. The patient will be instructed to do what? Hold their breath. Hold their breath as the anterior view is taken and also when the lateral view is taken. Okay, so that is very important patient teaching right there. All right, moving on to pelvic ultrasonography. Okay, this is uh, Luckily, a non-invasive, safe, and painless uh, procedure that uses high-frequency sound waves. Um, when a, 
When a pelvic ultrasonography is done, we have to make sure that we encourage our patient to drink fluids prior to the ultrasound because a full bladder is necessary for test accuracy. So we have to have a full bladder for these test results from the pelvic ultrasound to be accurate because it allows for better visualization. Okay, uh, the full bladder helps, um, helps us to visualize the uterus better. Okay, so that is very important. So a full bladder is very important for better visualization okay, of the uterus. Uh, now, pelvic ultrasonography can be done to detect foreign bodies. It can be done to distinguish between cystic and solid tumors. It can evaluate fetal growth, different things like that. All right, moving on to tubal insufflation, also known as a Rubens test. Very, very important. Okay, so tubal insufflation, I know that that's the same thing as a Rubens test. I better make sure that I understand those are used interchangeably, okay? So those are used interchangeably, tubal insufflation and Rubens test, same thing. So first, let's figure out what does insufflation mean? What does that term mean? Insufflation means to blow up or fill with gas, okay? So that is what insufflation means, to blow up or fill with gas. So with a tubal insufflation or Rubens test, we're going to have insufflation, we're going to blow up or fill with gas, uh, the fallopian tubes, okay, with carbon dioxide. So we have the insufflation of the fallopian tubes with carbon dioxide. And why are we doing this? Well, to evaluate fallopian tube patency. What is the patency of the fallopian tubes? These can, uh, tubal insufflation or Rubens test can also be done to uh, perform fertility studies. Okay, when the tubes are open, the gas simply enters into the abdominal cavity and a high-pitched bubbling can be auscultated as the gas escapes from the tube. The patient might complain, again, of shoulder pain. Remember, we already talked about this. So the patient may complain of that referred pain known um, for them as shoulder pain. That is also known as referred pain. The pain is not actually in the shoulder, but the pain is being referred to that area. So they might complain of shoulder pain due to that irritation of the diaphragm that can occur with the uh, insufflation of the carbon dioxide. Now, if the tubes are occluded, okay, if there is a problem with the tubes and the tubes are occluded, that gas cannot escape from the tubes and the patient is not going to report any pain. Okay, so make sure that you know what a tubal insufflation is. What is it? What is a Rubens test? Okay, we're, we're having insufflation, we're putting gas, uh, we're blowing up or filling with gas uh, into the fallopian tubes with carbon dioxide. And why are we doing it? We're evaluating fallopian tube patency, and it's also done for fertility studies. And when the tubes are open, the gas just simply enters into the abdominal cavity, and you can hear a high-pitched bubbling when you auscultate, okay? And that is just the gas escaping from the tubes. The patient, again, might complain of shoulder pain due to that uh, diaphragm irritation. If the, if the patient's tubes are occluded, the gas will not escape from the tubes, and they will not report any pain. So know what tubal insufflation or Rubens test is. All right, human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG. First off, uh, we remember from a and um, HCG is a hormone that's uh, made by cells in the placenta, which helps to nourish the egg, okay? So with HCG, uh, it is secreted into the urine after fertilization occurs. It's uh, detected in pregnancy tests. Uh, it's again, just a hormone produced during pregnancy. Now, false positives are possible, okay? And what are some things that can give us a false positive uh, with HCG? Uh, if a person uh, is taking fertility drugs, that can cause a false positive. If they have cysts, if they have some cancers, that can cause a false positive HCG. Um, the next test, very, very important, serum CA-125. Hey, this is a tumor antigen, okay, a tumor antigen um, associated with ovarian cancer, 
and it is positive 80% of the time. So again, what is a serum CA125? It is a tumor antigen that's associated with what? Ovarian cancer, and it is positive 80% of the time. Now, CA125 is useful in detecting a reoccurrence of ovarian cancer. Uh, it is also used to follow chemo treatment to see if there's a positive response and the CA125 levels decrease. That would be a positive response to chemo. Now, if chemo causes, uh, again, a decline in that CA125, that's indicating a good response to the chemo treatment. But there are some other conditions that can cause uh, a positive CA125, and we'll talk about later, things like endometriosis, PID, okay, things like that. So again, with serum CA125, this is a tumor antigen that's associated with ovarian cancer. And again, it is positive 80% in 80% of the cases. Uh, again, useful in detecting the reoccurrence of ovarian cancer, and also it's important uh, in following uh, the response to chemo. So very important. Here we have uh, our example of what we talked about earlier with the colposcopy. Okay, you can see there what's going on. There's just direct visualization going on there of the cervix and the vagina. Okay, so that is what is going on there. They look for things like uh, tissue color, lesions, vascular conditions. They can do specimens during this. Um, again, so uh, that's just something that uh, you may see done during your career, uh, depending on where you work. So this is just a colposcopy. You can see in the inset picture there, a picture of the colposcope and uh, it's just providing that microscopic visualization of the vaginal walls and also the cervix. So that is colposcopy. A coldoscopy we talked about. Uh, this is providing visualization of the uterus and its appendages. Again, we said it's providing visualization not only of the uterus, but also of the ovaries and the fallopian tubes. Okay, this is considered to be a vaginal operation because okay, you can see them going through the back side of the vagina right there to view the uterus and the fallopian tubes and also the ovaries. So again, you can see there uh, the coldoscope going through that uh, wall of the vagina there and looking at the uterus and its appendages. So that is a coldoscopy. Here you have uh, laparoscopy. Again, they've uh, made a puncture through the abdomen. They're going in there. Uh, through that small incision uh, to examine the abdominal cavity okay, with the laparoscope. That's providing, again, direct visualization of the uterus and its appendages. So we're looking at the uterus, the ovaries, and the fallopian tubes. Again, uh, the stomach, the abdomen will be inflated okay, with carbon dioxide. And again, uh, that helps for better visualization of those uh, anatomical areas there. And again, with the inflation with carbon dioxide, it's very common that patients experience a referred shoulder pain with this. So we teach our patient that that is a normal response. Here we have cervix conization or cervical conization, and it's showing you right there in that picture uh, the cone area that is being removed. Okay, it shows you in the one inset where they are cutting around, and then it shows you the exact area that will be removed during this uh, conization. So again, they can remove eroded or infected tissue during this procedure. They can also confirm a cervical cancer. And again, just that cone-shaped section is going to be removed. With this, we're thinking about, remember, hemorrhaging, watching for hemorrhaging, watching for infection. Now we're going to take a look at the diagnostic tests for the male. Okay, the first one we're going to talk about is testicular biopsy, which is extremely important and you better make sure you know it. So why is a testicular biopsy performed? Well it's done to, uh, for the detection of abnormal cells and also for the presence of sperm. Uh, it may be done by aspiration or incision and I have included in my slides a picture of a testicular biopsy for you to look at. So again uh, it's done for the detection of abnormal cells and for the presence of sperm. It can be done via aspiration or incision. Tissue is going to be removed from the testicle when we're thinking about a testicular biopsy. So tissue is going to be removed from the testicle. 
Very important post biopsy care. Very important. Okay. So post biopsy care includes scrotal support. Okay. There is a difference between a scrotum and a penis. This says scrotal support. Okay. So that is some of my post biopsy care. Scrotal support, ice pack, analgesics, warm sits bath. Okay, to decrease edema. Instruct the patient to notify the physician if bleeding or an increase in temperature occurs once they go home. Okay, so that's some important post-biopsy care that you better make sure that you know. So scrotal support, ice pack, analgesics, warm sits bath to decrease edema, and instruct that patient to notify the physician if bleeding or an increase in temperature starts to occur. Next one we're going to talk about is semen analysis. Very, very important. So with a semen analysis, this is going to evaluate fertility. And why, why is a semen analysis performed? Well, it is performed for uh, the following reasons. To assess vasectomy effectiveness. So we're going to assess the effectiveness of a vasectomy after a male has one. Okay, is it effect? Was the vasectomy effective? So that is one reason why we do a semen analysis to assess vasectomy effectiveness. Also, to detect semen presence related to rapes, and also to determine paternity. Okay, so very very important that I know the reasons why we are doing a semen analysis to assess vasectomy effectiveness, to detect semen presence related to rapes, and also to determine paternity. All right, prostatic smears. These are done to detect and identify microorganisms, uh, tumor cells, and even tuberculosis in the prostate. Okay, when, what you will learn about when you get into the third term with tuberculosis, tuberculosis is just not confined, okay? to the lungs. People think it only affects the lungs. No, it can spread to other organs. It's a bacteria that spreads to other organs. And again, uh, that's something you'll learn more about in the third term when you get to your respiratory unit. Now, how do they do a prostatic smear? Well, the, the healthcare uh, practitioner massages the prostate okay, through the rectum, and then the patient voids into a sterile container. And then the specimen is simply collected uh, and the smear is prepared in the lab. Okay, plain and simple. It's all we need to know. Cystoscopy. Uh, having, I have incorporated a slide for you to see um, uh, pertaining to cystoscopy, so make sure you take a look at that. Uh, when we think about cystoscopy, the prostate and bladder okay, is examined by passing a lighted cystoscope through the urethra and to the bladder. Um, always make sure you obtain consent before these types of procedures. You've provided your patient education. Uh, you have performed, um, when you think about this, you're teaching your patient that it will be performed uh, with sedation, mild sedation, or with anesthesia. That's up to the practitioner, not up to us. Uh, a numbing gel to the urethra will be used for the passage of the scope, so that will calm your patient's nerves. You know, because they're thinking, oh my gosh, this huge scope is going to be passed uh, through my penis and into my bladder. And, you know, they get very uh, anxious. So make sure you explain to them. You know, it's going to not only be performed with some sedation or anesthesia, but it's also, we're also going to be using a numbing gel for the urethra when the scope is passed. Now, after the procedure, make sure uh, that the patient knows that they may have pink tinged urine. Okay, they might also have frequency and burning on urination, and that makes perfect sense. When you have a scope being passed into the penis and into the bladder, it makes sense that they're going to have some slight pink tinged urine. What we're going to be mindful of is if they're having a lot of bright red, ur uh, bright red urine, because that's telling me this patient is having active hemorrhaging going on when I'm seeing bright red blood, okay, or bright red urine. Okay, either one. That is telling me there's a problem. But pink tinged urine is perfectly fine. 
It's perfectly fine for them to experience frequency and burning because of the scope, okay, the passage of the scope. So those things are normal. Now, bathing may be restricted. So uh, warm compresses may be used at the urinary opening to help with comfort. Cystoscopy is done for both men and women, and it's done to detect things like bladder infections, tumors, things like that. PSA. PSA is extremely important. This has been on people's boards so many times I can't even tell you. So what is a PSA? It stands for prostate specific antigen. Uh, this is usually done with a rectal exam. The PSA shows up in the bloodstream with prostate cancer. Uh, it also though can be uh, showing up in the bloodstream due to other conditions like BPH or prostate enlargement. Okay, and those are not cancerous, but PSA tends to show up in the bloodstream with prostate cancer. So just because a person has an elevated PSA does not absolutely mean they have prostate cancer. There's a good chance of it, but it could also be due to just prostate enlargement, like with BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia. Okay, we'll talk more about that later. Now, very importantly, a normal PSA. A normal PSA is less than four nanograms per milliliter. I want to say that one more time. A normal PSA is less than four nanograms per milliliter. So for a PSA to be normal, it needs to be less than four. So four would be abnormal. Below four would be normal. So normal PSA is less than four nanograms per milliliter. Even the slightest increase in PSA levels need to be closely monitored. This patient needs to be referred to a urologist, okay, for biopsy. All right, another study is called the um, ALP test. That's um, a test that is also done, alkaline phosphatase, and it is also useful in the diagnosis of things like BPH, prostatic cancer, bone metastasis with prostate cancer, and other diseases. It is simply done by a, a blood draw. Okay, that's how they do it. Now, alkaline phosphatase, we've talked about this before. It's just a protein that's found in body tissues, and it tends to increase uh, with things like cancer and other types of diseases. So anytime a person has an increased ALP, there is, there is going to have to be further investigation done to rule out cancer. So that is uh, an ALP is just an alkaline phosphatase and that's done by simply a blood draw. Here's our example of a testicular biopsy. Okay, Again, we said with a testicular biopsy, this is done for the detection of abnormal cells, also done for the presence of sperm. Uh, again, it can be done by aspiration or incision. This example, of course, is by aspiration with the needle. And what is being done here? Tissue is being removed from the testicle, okay? Again, what I told you to make sure you remember with a testicular biopsy, you better remember that post-biopsy care, that scrotal support, those ice packs, analgesics, warm sits back to decrease edema. And again, important patient education, make sure you teach your patient to notify their physician if they have bleeding or if they have a fever, okay? Remember, that's very important to remember. Here we have an example of what we were talking about with a cystoscopy. Again, a cystoscopy can be done on males or females, and this one, of course, is done on a male, and it's just showing you the cystoscope, and it's showing you it going through the penis and into the bladder. So with a cystoscopy, uh, we said it's performed with sedation or anesthesia. They use a numbing gel uh, to the urethra because of that passage of that scope. Again, after the procedure, we said that patient might have some pink-tinged urine, uh, frequency and burning with urination. All those things are normal. Uh, again, the thing we would be worried about if we were seeing a lot of bright red blood coming from the penis or when they urinate, we see a lot of bright red urine. Okay, that's telling us this patient is hemorrhaging. Okay, so again, this is just an example of cystoscopy.